Welcome to Money Talks. I'm Genevieve Westcott with the latest financial news from across New Zealand and around the globe. In this edition, is our economy really on the road to recovery? Find out the latest predictions from one of New Zealand's top bank economists. How's the rest of the world faring? You may think it's all doom and gloom on the global front, but good news, it's in pretty good shape, according to some. And how the growing influence of Asia and New Zealand's rising terms of trade could mean a structural shift in the New Zealand and U.S. dollars. Need to know info, so listen up. All this and much, much more coming up. Here to tell us about the ASB's latest economic quarterly report is the chief economist from ASB himself, Nick Tuffley. Nick, always wonderful to have you on the show. Good to be here. All right, tell me about the, uh, the, the quarterly report now that has just come out. Things are looking pretty good here in New Zealand. Things are looking better, certainly better than what they were in the second half of last year. So what we're seeing is more signs that the economy is starting to gather a bit of momentum um, across a greater number of sectors. So it's not just about our export earnings, we're actually seeing the, the household side starting to perk up a little bit and a little bit more activity coming through from businesses. And you're also telling us that the global economy is, uh, is, is doing better than most of us think as well. Tell me more. It is doing... OK, all we tend to hear about is the, the bad news stories, particularly out of Europe and, and the US. So for New Zealand, the, the key change that we've been seeing happen over the last five to ten years is the emergence of Asia and what that's doing to our export story. Now, Asia is still growing relatively fast. It is slowing a bit after some pretty unsustainable growth, but it's actually looking in, in reasonable shape. Uh, and not suffering any of these big structural problems that we are seeing happening in, throughout Europe and the US. OK, let's bring it on home now. Uh, uh, retail spending is up. That's looking good. Housing also is uh, doing better. What can you tell me? Well, with retailing, we went through quite a soft patch last year, so a lot of caution. This year, we have seen retail spending start to pick up and a bit more focus on durable items as well. And that's one of those things where if you are being pretty careful about your money, you tend to avoid spending money on, on things like that. So some more signs of life. The retail sector's not going to be going through boom times, but it is going to be seeing uh, slightly faster growth coming through helped as our incomes continue to grow and employment increases over time. And more business activity and growth activity outside of the Canterbury uh, region than uh, most of us expected. Yes, that was the real surprise with the GDP figures for the first quarter. Now that's very backward looking. You have to get your telescope out to look at the rear vision mirror. But what it showed was 0.8% growth in a quarter where we've had pretty much our biggest natural disaster in modern history, that's pretty good. And we are starting to see some of the growth coming through in sectors like manufacturing, some of those traditional but quite important industries doing quite well. For the farmers at home, let's talk about export commodity prices. There, there have been boom times, but uh, not quite as good. Uh, what are you picking going forward? We have seen very, very elevated across the board with our commodity prices. So that's unlikely to be sustained. Uh, we do have the issue that the New Zealand dollar is firm against the US dollar and the pound, so that doesn't help to some degree. And prices uh, in global markets probably peaking and likely to come down. But I think the outlook's still pretty robust. But things like, say, the dairy payout or recent meat prices, probably not sustainable and we'll settle back to something uh, still firm, but not quite at the levels that we've seen recently. And let's talk about the Reserve Bank, of course. Uh, what do you think is going to happen out of the official cash rate? We have the meeting this week, uh, unlikely to see a uh, change in the cash rate at this stage, but there's been growing speculation that we'll see a rate increase this year. So I think it's highly likely that we'll have a rate increase by Christmas. And there's a lot of debate now about whether or not there'll be a, a rate increase as soon as September or, or October. We think probably December, but the risks are it's a bit earlier in October. Let's talk about the U.S. and we'll talk more in depth with, with our next panellists in part two. But uh, we see that, of course, President Obama has gone back trying to sell his message straight to the American people yesterday. Uh, what's going on? Well, there still is uh, a lot of room that needs to be crossed before both sides of the, the political system come, come to an agreement. Yesterday we had President Obama and then the Republican uh, Speaker of the House uh, also addressing the nation, sort of basically essentially blaming the other for, for not reaching an agreement. So in the short term, that's causing quite a lot of market concern about the inability to reach an agreement, the prospect of a ratings downgrade, or even actually getting to a point where they miss some payments. So we're actually seeing the New Zealand dollar uh, get pushed up as the US dollar just gets slapped down. Gee, it hit over 87 cents this morning. 
Yes, uh, at one stage overnight we were up uh, around 87.40. So look, we've basically gone up about a cent in the space of 24 hours and it is pretty much entirely down to what's happening in the U.S. But exporters are going to really have to pay attention because the whole structural shift in the New Zealand dollar has changed, hasn't it? Yes, going forward we're likely to find that at least against the US dollar we do average a lot higher than what we used to. So the first 20 years of the float after 1985 we averaged around 57 cents. Uh, since 2005 we've averaged 70. Now what we're seeing happen is Asia is really starting to drive the global economy and drive the commodity price cycle uh, and instead of our currency collapsing whenever the US dollar uh, the US economy slows what we're seeing now is Asia is holding up commodity prices at, at higher levels. Our terms of trade which is basically uh, how many TVs we get per uh, container of butter are a lot higher and likely to remain that way going forward and we're likely to see our, our New Zealand dollar shift up uh, to reflect that. Thanks Nick. Coming up after the break, with just over a week to go before the U.S. runs out of money to pay its bills, Democrats and Republicans appear no closer to agreement. And U.S. President Barack Obama turned to TV and talked directly to the American people who are increasingly nervous. What that deadly high-speed train crash in China that killed 38 and injured at least 194 people tells us about China's relentless pursuit of business. And the latest word from Greece, it ain't over yet. As we head to break, the latest Federated Farmers Confidence Survey shows farmers are a bit more optimistic about the state of the economy, although only 16% felt the economy would improve in the next 12 months. But farmers were much more confident when it came to their own businesses. So answer this in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. What percentage of New Zealand farmers expect improvements in their own farms in the next year? Find out when we return. Stay with us. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, what percentage of New Zealand farmers expect improvements in their own farms in the next year? 45.8% of farmers think their businesses will improve. That is good news, but something that isn't improving is the state of the U.S. economy. Joining us now is Professor of International Business at Massey University, Usha Haley, who is also a research associate with the Economic Policy Institute in Washington, D.C. Usha, wonderful to have you back on the show, and you have come uh, right from the United States. First of all, what's the mood there? I think there's, the U.S. people are going a pox on both parties. I mean, they're just tired of all the wrangling, etc. I'm fairly optimistic and I think most people are, that the U.S. will reach a resolution on the debt issue. So I don't think that's a really a big problem because the media keeps highlighting the uh, discrepancy between the two parties' positions. However, there is also a very large common ground that the media is not discussing. Nick, I noticed that the new lady who's heading up the IMF, uh, Ms. Lagarde, uh, she is saying that it would be very, very, very serious for the global economy if the boys in Washington don't get their act together. Are you picking they will do a deal? I would expect that they would. Uh, we've seen the debt ceiling being raised 76 times in the past, so they will get to that point that they do it. Where the economic risk starts coming through is if they don't actually reach the agreement until a, just a little period after they actually run out of money and have to start effectively defaulting on some of the expenses that they, they're obliged to be paying. Let me take you back to something that John Key said just before he went to Washington uh, earlier this month to talk to them about a trade deal. Also talking about how we can grow our economies and trade more together. Uh, America is a critical part of what's called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, that's eight countries uh, looking to form a free trade agreement uh, that comes out of the APEC region and we in New Zealand would have a lot to gain from that free trade agreement as we have greater access to the three or four hundred million people uh, that call America home. So it's going to be uh, an interesting uh, visit. Uh, I'm sure it'll be one that'll be very informative. There are real challenges in the United States as you're probably aware at the moment. There are very large debt levels, uh, a rising government deficit and of course a very sticky unemployment rate at 9.2%. What do you think uh, the U.S. debt crisis means for guys like John Key when they go to Washington and meet with the leaders trying to do more business? Oh, I don't think the debt crisis affects John Key and his visit to Washington. Uh, 
As a matter of fact, what John Key said was that he had the best visit he had ever had to Washington, and he met everyone that he wanted to meet. So I think in that way, it's really positive. Uh, but he said there were a couple of sticking points. The U.S. does not really want a free trade agreement with New Zealand, and that's because it's very difficult to get a free trade agreement with a small country through Congress. But it is interested in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. A couple of sticking points, Pharmac is one of them, and intellectual property issues. For New Zealand, the key issue with uh, the negotiations is making sure, well for any of our trade negotiations, is making sure that agriculture doesn't get put off to one side and taken out of the equation because that is still a huge important part of our export industry and it is unfortunately the one that globally tends to ha have the most political meddling in in terms of protectionism. Yeah, yeah. And meantime, uh, we talked a little bit earlier, Nick, about uh, the rising uh, New Zealand dollar. What is the risk to the global economy if they don't do a deal? Usha. Frankly, I don't think that's going to come about. At the worst case scenario, the International Monetary Fund released a, the annual bill of health that it does for the U.S. and said that the U.S. economy could, the growth could fall about 5% and global growth could fall about 3 to 4 percent. But that's the worst case scenario. And I think there will be a deal. I think it's a game of chicken. Let's move now to Europe. And of course, uh, another deal has been done to give Greece more money, but it is far from resolved, Nick. Yes, I'd, I'd call it the, the meatloaf deal where two out of three ain't bad with what we've seen. Is, uh, the first key important part is we've seen the, the debt burden in terms of the servicing costs uh, being uh, reduced to lower interest rate and the debts being termed out further. So that makes it easier to service the burden. We have seen efforts put in place to stop contagion to governments and to the banking sector. But the, the big burning long-term question is, is just simply, is there too much debt for Greece to ever really be able to repay and the, the struggle it will have in terms of trying to turn its, uh, its finances around to uh, quickly enough to reduce that burden. So they, they do have a long way to go, and I think Greece themselves aren't too sure if they're going to be able to pull it off. Uh, and the IMF I'm picking is still a little bit nervous. Well, what Greece has said they've agreed to do is a five-year austerity plan. Now, they had to agree to that to get the get some money, uh, but I think it's going to be a real challenge for them to, to meet that. And some of the things that they haven't looked at with the economy is, is reforming it to make it more efficient, and that's a pretty pressing issue for not just Greece, but Portugal, Ireland, Spain, Italy as well. Uh, Nick, earlier you said that uh, we are very much tied at the hip to China, although growth there is slowing uh, a little bit. This week we saw a horrible train wreck, Usha, uh, yeah. there. And what does this tell us about the Chinese approach to doing business? Why do you think this is significant? Every once in a while we get a glimpse of the institutional problems that underlie Chinese growth, and this is one of them. Corruption, who skimmed off money, um, not really adhering to speed limits, and really, in, in a deeper sense, the patchwork techno of technology that is spurring this growth. China has borrowed from various sources, the French and the German and the Japanese, and I use the term borrowed loosely, to knit together this patchwork of the largest ra high-speed railway network in the world. And they don't really, the, the little pieces don't really mesh well. And that's what happened. I mean, the corruption reared, reared its ugly head. Um, there are other deep problems. I mean, there are problems with the fact that rail tickets on these high-speed rails are so high that ordinary Chinese can no longer afford rail fare. So now they have to go by bus. Apparently, Chinese authorities, a lot of, uh, a lot of people now saying over the Internet that they tried to hush the whole thing up, although apparently there is an open inquiry into what went wrong. Uh, this is, again, another case of, of the authorities perhaps cutting corners. Uh, and the rest of the world is watching. I think China, there's a lot to grow in China. I mean, there is, there's infrastructure to grow. There is manufacturing to grow, etc. But a lot of this is occurring on shifting sands, the shifting sands of corruption. And there has been a massive amount of corruption there, skimming off of money, um, faulty and, and uh, uh, construction. And then the deep-seated unrest of the people. I mean, there is unrest when people can't afford rail fare, for example, yeah. and have to travel by bus. Yeah, I mean, here's because, a country that wants to make their name around the world yeah. with, with doing this, but... Uh, not taking care of their own people, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it is a kind of an uneasy marriage we have with China at the moment, Nick. Uh, would, you, would you go so far as to say that? 
Well, we are dealing with a country which operates in a very different way to what, what we do. It, it has a very different government structure. It's not, not exactly a democracy. It embraces some parts of capitalism, but it's still very strongly wedded to socialism and other areas. So we, look, we're dealing with people, institutions, a system of government, which is not our home, home one. So we do have to learn a lot about how it's, how it's operating so that we can more effectively uh, enter that market. And I think too often it does feel like we have a tiger by a tail. Well, it's a, it's a very big country that is going to become more influential uh, going forward over the next 20 years. Its economic might, its political might globally, its military might uh, will, are all set to increase over the next little while. Well, what I've been researching, and I've been looking at Chinese subsidies, is where the money comes from. I mean, where is this boom, you know, how is this boom being fueled? And what I've been looking at is, um, and what I've been finding is a lot of off-the-book records, um, shadow financing, arm's length financing, and that's the scary part. The amount of debt, conservatively, if you look and if you start show, in some way calculating some of this off-the-book financing, Chinese, the Chinese debt to GDP ratio is probably between 150 to 175 percent. Wow, wow. But you know, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, the China free trade uh, deal that we uh, set up with them, what, four years ago, has been pretty good to us. I mean, dairy exports have, have uh, uh, now at, what, two billion dollars and going up. So we really need them. It's just how do we make sure that we're not totally swamped by them? I guess that's uh, the question. That's a very good question. For a small country like New Zealand, you end up having a bit of a symbiotic relationship. Uh, Australia's got the, got the same thing with, with minerals, and even the US, uh, the world's largest economy, is, is very, very tied at the hip to, to China, given so much of its manufacturing has essentially been exported to uh, China. Uh, and it's so heavily reliant on Chinese goods. And, yeah. and not only that, I'm going to read this because I want to make sure I get it right. At the end of March of this year, China accumulated $3.4 trillion U.S. dollars in foreign currency reserves. I mean, that is phenomenal. China is everywhere. Well, as you know, some of my work is being used to look at the trade relationship in, between the U.S. manufacturing sectors and uh, China and this enormous imbalance and the economic disruptions that it's causing in the U.S. So that's one of the reasons I'm interested in looking at how this Chinese manufacturing is being funded. And I'm finding out things that are pretty disconcerting. A lot of this financing, as I said, is off the books. It's shadow financing. So as we know, and we're, we're all in consternation about the United States, the largest economy in the world, with a debt to, to GDP ratio of 92 or 93 percent, well, what do you think of China's 150 to 175 percent? Yeah, unbelievable. I mean, Greece's is 172 percent or so, and the, the Eurozone has been affected by that. So this, as China gets more enmeshed into the global economy, these questions are going to be asked more and more. Because any disruptions in China will affect the world. Let me ask you in very simple terms, looking at the U.S., the pair of you, if you had President Obama's ear, what would you tell him to do? Nick? Is this regarding just China or is this regarding the, the is, whole economy? Let, the economy. <laughs> let's, let's talk about the U.S. economy. What do you think they need to do to get out of, the, to get out of trouble? They've, they've got a couple of issues. I think one is just overall the, the whole economy is overly dependent on debt. You are seeing the household side start to correct that, which is encouraging. So debt levels reducing uh, in households. The government side, the, the issue with uh, trying to turn around government's finances is you don't have quite the same pressure in, in the US that you do in, in Greece. It's not, it's not that bad and you still have a lot of people who are prepared to fund the US, but you do need to start looking quite hard at the quality of your government expenditure. And that's something where governments aren't so good at doing. They tend to look at the quantity, uh, not the quality, and that's a, that's a big issue. And the other question is, is, look, the overall size of your government, what's, what's appropriate? And that's more of a political question, and different political parties have different views. Yeah, and so many tiers of government in the States as well. I mean, in New Zealand, we're relatively lucky. It's, I, I know when I first came here from Canada, I couldn't believe uh, how few governments there were compared to back home. Yeah. Osho, what do you think the American people need to do to get out of the mess they're in? Well, can I tackle the China question first? Oh, sure. I'd say, Mr. President, look very carefully before you leap. 
uh, China has moved in the space of five years from being a net importer to becoming the largest manufacturer and exporter in the world in several industries that we would consider capital intensive. So it's not la low labor costs that are doing this. It's sources of financing and subsidies. And I'd say, look, get somebody who's a China expert on your board of advisors and have them advise you because an, econo an economic sector that's wiped out is wiped out forever. Thanks. Coming up after the break, future proof. Head along for the ride as our experts hit the road and tell us what they'll be tracking over the next seven days. But first, a question for you in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. Back to the latest Federated Farmers survey. What percentage of New Zealand farmers say they'll be spending less in the coming year? The answer when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, what percentage of New Zealand farmers say they'll be spending less in the coming year? 45.6% of farmers will spend less next year than they did in the year before as they focus on paying down debt. And now it's time for Future Proof. What's coming up for our experts? And we'll start with Usha, who in September will be traveling to London to speak at the High Growth Market Summit. And this is very prestigious, put on by The uh, Economist. Yes, I'm excited. Uh, there are some stars there. There's Mike Spence, who's a Nobel laureate. Uh, there's the ex-president of Brazil, Lula. There is uh, Juan Carlos Echeverri, who's the finance minister of Colombia. And, of course, there's me. <laughs> yeah. So this is a so, gathering of something like, what, 350 uh, world uh, innovators, world leaders, politicians, uh, the top uh, financial media. Well, I've been researching high growth markets, and especially China, and I'm an expert on business government relations with China. And so they want me to talk about that and um, that aspect of it. Excellent. So, uh, and what the China are, price. And, and the China price. So what will your message be to them? And, and, and what are some of the messages you think you'll be hearing from other world leaders? Well, I can't speak for the other world leaders, but so far as I'm concerned, I'm going to be talking a bit about my research and uh, where the funding is going into manufacturing and how companies that want to profit in China and governments that want to deal effectively with China have to behave in this instance. So uh, the, the landscape is changing. The landscape isn't what we're used to or what we've studied for the most part. And, and that should be an input into our strategic decision making. That's true. Uh, Nick, uh, developing nations now, they are the future. And countries like ours are kind of going on to the back burner. Uh, what do we need to be aware of uh, uh, moving forward, do you think? I think we need to be very conscious of the opportunities that are there. I think we're actually quite well positioned given geographically where we are and also the types of goods that we are producing and particularly out of the agricultural sector. We produce high quality food and there's going to be a lot of call for that coming out of the Asia Pacific region going forward. So but we're, we're, we're only ever going to be able to produce such a tiny amount of it. Is that going to be enough? Uh, is there going to be some day where the world turns off dairy for example? Well, it doesn't seem to be as we, as we get uh, wealthier and wealthier, we, we, want, we want more. Uh, look, if New Zealand only ends up uh, able to, physically able to meet a small portion of that demand, uh, it's still going to be a huge kick for New Zealand's economy. Uh, and we are still the world's biggest dairy exporter at the moment, so we're likely to play an influential role. Interesting. Over the next 20 years, 275 million people will have moved to Indian cities and 400 million will have moved to Chinese cities. As well, there's going to be a huge growth of middle classes in Africa. Now, there's a part of the world that New Zealand really hasn't targeted. Well, yes, but New Zealand is a relatively small economy, and in this case, I think New Zealand should err on the side of caution. <laughs> Just rampantly running into every major <laughs> China alone will swallow for opportunities. us up. <laughs> I mean, I think New Zealand should move cautiously, understanding before putting a next step forward. So I, I don't think there's anything wrong with what New Zealand's doing. <laughs> all right, we're doing all right here. Good to know. Good yeah. to know. Uh, Nick, very quickly, what are you going to be watching over the next seven days? Well, Reserve Bank's pretty key. So more confidence in the recovery from the Reserve Bank, more concern about inflation. Probably the way things are going with the currency, a lot of pointed comments on, on that as well. So that's going to be a, a big important thing. And also what's happening in, in the US. The, what, it's really knocking around financial markets. When we get some resolution, we're likely to see some relief rally in the, the US dollar, and that'll take some of the pressure off our currency. 
But the more that these clowns keep on mucking around, the more risk we've got of our currency getting pushed up in the short term. Thank you so much. Thanks to my guests, Usha Haley and Nick Tuffley. We love to hear your feedback, so be sure to check out our website. Meantime, who would you pick to win a fight in the paddock? An ornery Canadian black bear with killer claws or a cow? Well, over in Kettle Valley, British Columbia, a black bear had been bothering Farmer Wayne's cow herd. This 12-year-old blonde Simmental mother knows that bears are bad news. Despite being bitten and clawed by the bear, she tried to take him down. A seven-year-old Angus cross cow moved in to help her crush the bear. Eventually, the bear staggered to its feet and made an undignified getaway. Motto, don't mess with mums, especially the bovine kind. Keep the faith. See you next time.